Hello, everybody. Uh, you don't realize this, but this is take five for me. I'm having a tough time getting this started. But today I'm going to speak to you about women during the temperance movement and the suffrage movement. Temperance being the movement to ban alcohol and suffrage the right to vote. And I will do my best to keep it under the 15 minute uh, time frame. So here we go. Temperance is the movement to ban alcohol. And why are women so opposed to alcohol in society? They believe that it was the cause of many of their problems, specifically poverty, with men spending all their money at the bar, men abusing them when they came home, uh, health concerns for the men, and poor productivity on the job. So in, in order to work to get alcohol banned, one man stands out, and yes, I did say a man. His name is Neil Dow, and a lot of times people call him the Napoleon of Temperance. Maine will be the first state to ban alcohol, and they did so in 1851. So this only lasted for about five years. Um, he was uh, the mayor of Portland, and he personally made sure that anybody who protested against uh, his decision to ban alcohol would be attacked by the state militia. So there was actually a big riot in the city of Portland when one person died. Um, Maine is not the only state to do so, but they did try various experiments to make alcohol illegal, but it will not be until 1919 that alcohol will be banned by an amendment. Now, this lady, Carrie A. Nation, um, who was, I think, on her third husband, I think her second husband's last name was Nation, and that's when she thought she was being selected by God to carry the nation. But she published magazines titled The Hatchet. And you can see there she is known for coming into bars and saloons and bashing all of the tables and all of the kegs of beer and the chairs. Um, she's about six feet tall, weighed about 180 pounds. She described herself as a bulldog running along the feet of Jesus, and she absolutely believed that she was chosen by God to fight this evil that is alcohol. Um, this one thing that I wrote here in Kansas, she went into a bar, she uh, threw stones at a very expensive painting, shattered the mirror, used her axe to destroy everything. In the book that I read from Gail Collins, they described her not as a temperance leader. They described her as part of the lunatic fringe. So just keep that in perspective when I get to the next person. Please be aware that um, it was both men and women in the temperance movement. There were over a thousand communities in Ohio alone. Ohio was a major location for the temperance movement. Um, there was uh, about 10,000 women protesting over the course of six months. They did so in the snow, and temperance just became um, kind of um, associated with trying to clean up American society. A lot of them blamed uh, alcohol uh, for many of the problems. They blamed immigrants for bringing alcohol, uh, or that, that habit over to the country. Now, the lady that I would like you to be most familiar with is Frances Willer. And I'm sorry to say, I wish I knew more about her. She has been described as the most famous woman that nobody knows. She is the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. And yes, religion played a key role in this. In the 1890s, there were 10 times the number of women in the WCTU as there were all suffrage groups combined. People, women were far more concerned about alcohol. Tampa, Tampa, Florida alone had three separate temperance groups, one for black women, one for white women, and one for Cubans. But it is Frances Willard that really put this all together. You see this little pledge here that they had people sign. She really coordinated the efforts for about 20 years. She gave one lecture a day. She worked tirelessly. But as you can see, she died in 1898, which means she did not get to see um, temperance come to, come to fruition. It will be the 18th Amendment, eventually, 
1919 that will make alcohol illegal. And we will learn about the impact of prohibition on, uh, on the country later when we get to the 1920s. And I'm realizing now that the screen has moved. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. Okay, um, so be familiar with Carrier Nation and Francis Willard. That will serve you the best. But now, let's get to women's rights. In class, I mentioned to you that New Jersey was the first, uh, New Jersey was the first state to give women the right to vote after the revolution. But as you can see by the date, they also ended women's suffrage after that controversy with voter fraud over the building of the, uh, the courthouse. So in 1807, now nobody can vote, uh, no female can vote in the country. Now, in 18, oh, I'm sorry, in 1848, Seneca Falls will be the location for the beginning of the women's rights movement. And this all started after certain women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Lucretia Mott, were denied entry to the World Abolitionist Conference, the World Anti-Slavery Conference in London. Many of these women are connected with abolition as well as their right to vote. And somebody you'll learn about later on, Frederick Douglass, originally did work with women and tried to help them. However, he, when African American males got the right to vote, some of the women are very disappointed that he didn't support their efforts. Keep that in mind when I get to a future slide. All right. So, here is Wyoming. And that is because the first state and it was territory, to grant women the right to vote after the Civil War. So New Jersey, had the, they gave the right to vote, but then took it away. Wyoming will be the first one to give women the right to vote. And it made a lot of sense there, because there were so few women. Uh, there was about a six-to-one ratio of men to women. So the territory clearly was trying to attract more women. An article was written at the time that was even assuring women you would not lose your femininity, femininity if you voted. And one of the ladies that came to visit was Anna Dickinson. And they even described Anna Dickinson um, in desperate, desperate measures that she would stay in the area. Many people refer to her as the Joan of Arc of this movement. Um, they, The people in Wyoming were really very touched by her efforts, of course, they also found her very attractive, but they really wanted a, a representative to give Wyoming a greater voice on the national scene. She was speaking out in terms of uh, abolition as well as women's suffrage. Um, and when the statehood issue came up for Wyoming, the House representatives said, well, we don't want to accept a state that gives women the right to vote. And people in Wyoming said, well, we will remain out of the Union for a 100 years rather than come in without our women. So finally, in 1890, they did give them the right to vote. Then Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton both visited, and the local newspaper referred to both of them as not very handsome. After, Colorado, after Wyoming, you will see Colorado, Utah, and Idaho all follow. So the western area, which is often referred to as the frontier, was much more democratic and much more open to giving women rights. Now, the um, one quick election, I probably should have reversed this, 1872, for any of you guys who are interested, there actually was a woman who kind of ran for president. Her name was Victoria Woodall. I remember when I was teaching about Sarah Palin when it was taking place, and I said, I think that we're on the verge of having a first female run for president. And a student corrected me and said, we've already had one, Victoria Woodall. I said, well, I don't think you're right, but we can look it up. And yet again, I was proven wrong. And then I was shocked to learn that she ran with Frederick Douglass, vice president, who never met her. This isn't really a, a team that is on the ballot in many states, but you can look it up. Obviously, I did not make this all up. And... This is the election where Susan B. Anthony will vote illegally. And I just find it ironic that she didn't vote for Victoria Woodall. Instead, she voted for 
Ulysses S. Grant, um, who would later on be the president. Okay, but here are the two women that I'd like you to know. One is Susan B. Anthony, and one is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I tried to give you early and later pictures for each of them. These women were friends for over 50 years, but they had very different personalities. Susan B. Anthony, for example, she never married. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was much more feminine, and she was, you know, fond of dressing nicely. She had seven children. Um, you know, Susan B. Anthony really regarded marriage as like a betrayal to the female cause. Um, she even didn't understand why women would want to even have children for all the, um, all the problems that that would bring. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had great ideas. She was the writer of all the speeches. She wrote all the essays in the newspapers. Um, she was very much um, the thinker of the group. Whereas Anthony was, Susan B. Anthony was the one that would expand the reformist impulse. She was the one that was the agitator and would rile people up. Uh, although Stanton did that as well. I mean, there was a time where Elizabeth Cady Stanton was celebrating her 80th birthday and she um, said at that time that the Bible should be rewritten, which is obviously quite shocking to people. Um, so, and both of these women were abolitionists. And please keep in mind, when African Americans earned the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, there was a big split in the movement. People like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton were very upset. Moderates, on the other hand, like Lucy Stone, they were okay. They felt that the pace was going properly. Susan B. Anthony even aligned herself with some racists because she was so felt so betrayed by Frederick Douglass. Um, and both of these women here, they both realized that they were not going to see this amendment passed, which is somewhat sad to think that they would work so long and not be able to live to that point. Now, the two groups that you should be familiar with are the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. And really, this is the key slide I'd like you to be familiar with. The National Women's, ah, the National Women's Suffrage Association, they wanted to work on a national level, meaning they wanted an amendment passed. They thought the only way women should be fighting for suffrage would be through an amendment to the Constitution. But then you have people like Lucy Stone, who were more moderate, and Lucy Stone wanted the state-by-state -state strategy. We have Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho. Why not just be patient and let's get this done one by one? So keep this in mind when we do our activity that there was a, you know, kind of a disagreement on should we be more aggressive on a national level or should we work state-by-state? -state? Now, it's important to note that the American women generally were far more conservative than those in England in fighting for suffrage. Uh, the women in England, they were smashing windows, throwing rocks, and then you have a lady, Emily Davison, who decided to throw herself in front of the king's horse during a derby race, and she was trampled to death. Um, not exactly something that seems the brightest uh, move. But then we have Alice Paul. So in America, she's definitely our most radical of the suffragists. Um, with, she had three law degrees, but she's totally focused on suffrage. Unlike the others who were interested in temperance and abolition, she is 100% committed to the suffrage cause. Um, and she hated the state-by-state -state strategy. She believed women would never win the right to vote if they did not have a constitutional amendment. Um, and she's dealing with Woodrow Wilson as president since 1912, and he made it very difficult. Um, he did not, you know, he once called women's suffrage the foundation of every evil in this country. Um, so Alice Paul decides that she's going to organize a protest at his inauguration. And she got 8,000 marchers to show up, um, 10 bands. Uh, then these protests continued. So for 18 months, 
she's deciding to pick up the White House. And at the time, suffragists are being shot at, they're uh, being dragged down the street. And then Alice Paul is sentenced to a six-month jail term. And while in jail, she stages a hunger strike. This um, led to her being force-fed by the prison guards with tubes down her throat. So Alice Paul is clearly one of the, if not the most radical figure in the movement. Now, this struggle that took place for, you know, since 1848 is going to culminate with, finally, the Susan B. Anthony Amendment being voted on. In order for an amendment to pass, it first must be, it first must be proposed by two-thirds of the House of Representatives and two-thirds of the Senate. And it took a little while, but they did finally get that uh, number. But now to be ratified, an amendment requires three-fourths of the states. And at this time, we had 48 states. So the magic number that they needed was 36. Well, they had 35 states. And the state they were all focusing on was Tennessee. And as the story goes, one person in Tennessee switched his vote. So this led to them needing one more person. And Harry Burns, he's right here, Harry Burns opened up a letter from his mother. And here is a copy of the letter. And in the letter she said, hurry and vote for suffrage. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. Carrie Chapman Cat is um, the head of the National um, Women's Suffrage Association. She took over for Susan B. Anthony. And it was that vote, that decision by Harry Burns to listen to his mother that led to the 19th Amendment being ratified. You know, I, I skipped this, but these votes were so, so touching. Men who were with their dying wives, a congressman who were told, please go vote instead of staying with me. One man who held off having surgery on his arm um, so that he could get the vote. Uh, other people being carried into the vote on a stretcher. This is a very inspirational time for women. And now I will end with, and I'm a little over and I apologize, but I really didn't, you know, I didn't say anything funny. I didn't digress. I just kind of kept it simple. Um, my dog kept quiet. These two women, the first one over here, who you will learn about, is Jeanette Rankin. And Jeanette Rankin is the first female elected to Congress. She was in the House of Representatives from Montana. And just a little note about her, she voted against World War I, and then she voted against World War II. So you get an idea what her opinions were. And then this lady over here, I will end on a note that will just really bring a tear to your eyes. Her name is Charlotte Woodward. And oh boy, Charlotte Woodward. Wow. The only female who attended the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 as a young teenager who was alive to see the 19th Amendment ratified. I repeat, she's the only one who's lived from Seneca Falls to cast a ballot in 1920. And on that incredibly patriotic note, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. I will have a handout for you, and um, we will have a little activity regarding these famous women. Have a good night, and I will talk to you tomorrow.